Okay, we are recording. Thank you everybody for joining us today um, from the comfort of your computers, uh, especially on like a rainy cold day like this. Uh, please give Marty your full attention while he talks about his mind methane project. Okay, thanks much, Liz, and uh, appreciate uh, folks coming out uh, this afternoon and having to listen to about the lurid topic of uh, buying methane emissions from underground coal mines. <clears throat> it's it's not lost on me that uh, it's uh, it's a Friday, it's St. Patrick's Day, and uh, there are actually two uh, NCAA tournament games going on as we speak. Uh, so um, uh, in that vein, I'll try to be efficient and interesting for you today and hopefully uh, make it uh, worth your time. Uh, before kind of getting into to the topic for the day, I want to acknowledge uh, my collaborators on this effort, uh, our own Steve Greb and Corlin Evil uh, helped out on this project uh, a great deal. Uh, we also worked with Marcella Guzman out of UK Chemistry, and then Sean Bailey out of UK Engineering and the UAV lab uh, that he heads up. So uh, just to be sure before I get any further along here, does everyone see the screen okay? Yep. Okay, yep. good. Okay, so uh, yeah. Uh, so let me just kind of give you a high level overview before we get into some of the science. So back uh, kind of coming out of our COVID days in 2021, um, an idea was hatched in the Energy and Environment Cabinet to analyze methane emissions from underground coal mines. Uh, there was an idea that perhaps, um, uh, you know, maybe these emissions could be monetized uh, either by directly capturing the methane uh, and or by getting carbon credits that could then be sold on the carbon markets. Uh, I'm really not going to speak <laughs> to those questions today uh, directly, but if we want to have a conversation later, uh, I'm happy to do that. Uh, but in reality, what this project ended up doing, and actually I think ended up uh, being making an important contribution to the effort in looking at methane emissions uh, from coal mines, is that um, we, uh, starting off with a review of the Mine Safety and Health Administration and the EPA Greenhouse Gas Reporting Program data for the last decade, we developed a research program to analyze uh, methane emissions from 22 underground mines in eastern and western Kentucky. The analysis were done on uh, basically infrared spectrometers that were deployed on KGS vehicles an airplane and a drone. And then at the end of the day, uh, and I'll speak to this a bit more, we really kind of evaluated the effectiveness of these different measurement platforms and recognizing and assessing uh, methane emissions. So before, this is a kind of a preamble for this and the next one or two slides, let me give you a motivation for uh, doing this kind of work. As you know, methane is a main component of natural gas. Uh, it's a relatively clean source of energy uh, with relatively being the operative word there. Uh, with that said, since the mid 1750s, so uh, methane leakage primarily from anthropogenic sources is responsible for about 25 to almost uh, third, uh, 33 percent of radiative forcing that we've seen uh, in the atmosphere. And despite the fact that it's present in the atmosphere at significantly lower concentrations as compared to CO2. So for example, I checked yesterday, global methane uh, concentrations are just shy of 1.9 parts per million, whereas uh, CO2 is, I think the last time I checked was 420 and counting. Uh, despite this difference, methane really has an outsized impact. Uh, and I kind of show, show this graphically on the right side here where if you look at it over a 20 year period, the global warming potential of a single molecule of methane is equivalent to about 84 molecules of CO2. Um, for that reason, it, you know, at least in the near term, it's of uh, considerable concern in trying to uh, mitigate uh, you know, near term global warming. 
And uh, you can see the quote by Emory Lovins at the top from the Rocky Mountain Institute, who uh, makes the astute observation that, you know, ignoring methane while focusing on CO2 is like uh, trying to uh, work on a chronic illness all the while, all the while you're uh, bleeding out in some major artery. So one of the challenge really kind of getting at abating methane emissions is that there are just so many sources of methane. It's really pervasive throughout all facets of our life. And that includes agriculture, of course, the energy sector with oil and gas and uh, the coal sector. Um, it's also uh, comes from natural sources such as wetlands and peat bogs and things like that. So this particular map was done uh, was actually developed in 2015 and 14 and published in 2016 uh, by Massacres and others where they did the painstaking work of actually uh, uh, aggregating methane sources uh, throughout, throughout the US. And you can see the methane concentrations, basically their emissions uh, per annum, uh, per kilometer squared here with the hot colors representing higher emissions, and of course, the cooler cover, co colors, lower emissions. Uh, again, there's thousands of sources coming from all sectors. And the challenge, of course, is if you're doing discrete and ground-based measurements, you know, you're basically uh, uh, climbing a hill that never relents uh, because you're always going to be behind the curve and trying to get ahead of, uh, get a handle on emissions. So. Um, one way to get at this challenge that I mentioned in the previous slide about trying to do discrete measurements, say on a ground-based campaign, is to actually do remote measurements that are either done from satellites or aircraft or some combination. And so this particular plot attempts to try to translate that, uh, that, that strategy where you have a kind of a, a, a sampling program or campaign and the, in the temporal scale of that campaign going from seconds all the way up to years along the x-axis. And then the spatial scale of that analysis, you know, you're, you're looking at individual sources uh, at the lower end of the y-axis, or, you know, are you in a position, depending on your methods, where you can look more regionally at, at broader sources. And so if you kind of look along this uh, spectrum here of uh, greater time scales and then greater length scales, kind of at this, uh, at the lower left here, you're looking at discrete measurements, either done, you know, on foot or by vehicle, and then moving up into the right, you then start moving into the realm where you're doing remote measurements, either uh, from uh, any covariance towers, uh, aircraft, and then finally, uh, probably the, the, the current state of uh, understanding and technology, we now have the ability to examine uh, methane emissions from satellites. Uh, and, you know, depending on the orbits, uh, those satellites then can revisit uh, uh, sites multiple times over. And the only thing that's required then is that uh, you have a client uh, or someone that's willing to pay the the cost uh, uh, to actually turn that spectrometer on and then process that data once it's acquired. Just to kind of give you a sense for, you know, the scale of the problem in the U.S. alone, if we just look at gas transport pipelines, you know, you're, work, you're looking at well in excess of 3,000 miles of pipelines. And so those types of very large scales really do require that we have and, and do our best to try to re, uh, use remote uh, measurements as much as possible. So <clears throat> um, I'll, I'll use this location slide to really kind of be our first salvo into, into the work that was done as part of this project. So as I mentioned, um, we, through a screening process, uh, uh, identify 22 underground mines, uh, both in the eastern and western side of the state. And, and this map, this series, these two maps shows the distribution of these mines. In western Kentucky, we have we identified three active mines, uh, two non-productive active, and two abandoned. So these categories are categories that are uh, recognized by the Mine Safety and Health Administration. And so 
uh, they're fairly self-explanatory. Non-productive active is a mine that's uh, temporarily shuttered. Uh, my understanding is that there's some hope that, uh, you know, maybe uh, given improvement in product prices or something going forward, those mines that uh, are classified as non-productive active might eventually revert to uh, becoming uh, an active mine again. So what you can see is that uh, on the western side of the state, uh, uh, we have fewer mines, but the mines tend to be larger over there, and we'll, we'll see that uh, in a subsequent plot. Whereas in the eastern side of the state, uh, the mines are more numerous, uh, but they tend to be smaller. So as we go through this, I'm not going to, uh, because of the time considerations, I'm only going to grab a few of these mines as examples to demonstrate what I think are some of the important points that we discovered as part of this uh, part of this project. Okay, so uh, the first step in our process, as I mentioned, was kind of a screening of the EPA databases and the MSHA databases. And this particular plot shows quarterly coal production along the x-axis versus then methane emissions uh, in metric tons on the y-axis, okay. Uh, I show uh, information here from uh, seven mines uh, in eastern and western Kentucky. The eastern Kentucky mines are shown with the icons that are filled, whereas the western Kentucky mines are shown with the icons that are opened. So I only show seven mines because this is data that I have uh, in which I have both methane emissions and coal production available uh, for these mines. This data goes from 2016 into about 2020, depending on the activity in the mine. So the interesting thing is, is when I, uh, if you go back a decade, uh, which is where I get my first data from the EPA in 2011, there were 24 mines in Kentucky that reported to the EPA and were required to do so. So that recording, that reporting threshold is 25,000 metric tons of CO2 equivalent per year. By the time we get five years later, by the time we get to 2016, the number of mines reporting then has dropped from 24 to seven, okay? And then uh, even though I don't show it, by the time we come into 2020, uh, we're now down to four mines in the state that meet the EPA reporting thresholds. So two things are happening here. First off, the number of operating mines in the state is decreasing, okay? And um, contrary to some current uh, advertisements on TV, <laughs> Uh, this decline in the number of mines and the amount of mine that's uh, amount of coal that's being mined actually was happening well before uh, we got our current president. So, um, so this has kind of been a long-term trend, and it's continued regardless of politics. It's being driven by macroeconomic factors, uh, and not primarily the rise of natural gas. Uh, that's displacing coal. And then specific to Kentucky has also been the depletion of resource. Okay, so we've been at this for well over 100 years and uh, coal is a finite resource. So, you know, those are the factors that are, are at play. So the thing that I would point out to you here is that kind of in general, as the amount of coal uh, that's being mined increases, uh, we then see a commensurate increase with the amount of methane that's emitted. But as you can see, it's not a very clean uh, relationship. There's a lot of noise and it. it's especially noisy in my mind, especially for mines in Eastern Kentucky, where the amount of methane, uh, even for a given mine uh, and for a given amount of coal can vary quite a bit. So uh, Steve and Cortland may wanna speak to that a little bit more uh, as we kind of wrap up today, but you know, kind of what that tells me is that uh, depending on the coal that's being mined in the coal foundation. phase, foundation. Uh, uh, you know, foundation. that can then impact the amount of uh, methane that's being liberated. So I guess the other thing I want to pull, uh, point out to you here is, is the number of large emitters decreases uh, 
uh, in the state, that means that you know, we still have smaller mines that are operated. And keep in mind that these mines are not required to report to EPA. So therefore, really the amount of methane that we're reporting for the state from, this, from the underground coal mine sector is probably uh, significantly underreported. So uh, back up here. So in addition to looking at the, the overall mines and using this as a selection process, you know, our idea, our strategy was just to select both very large mines and very small mines because we feel like that reflects kind of the state of play, so to speak, of coal mining in Kentucky. But the other thing it does from an analytical perspective is that it then puts our instruments uh, that we tried to use for detection at looking at a variety of potential uh, emissions magnitudes. So uh, kind of at the upper right, you know, you're gonna have these really large magnitude emissions and we'd expect to be successful here. But then when you get down to these lower levels of emissions, the question then becomes, you know, do you really have that analytical threshold in a real field setting to detect methane? So in addition to selecting mines, for each of the mines, uh, we selected specific parts of the mine that could emit methane. So this particular example is from the number 77 mine in Perry County, okay? It's a Google Earth image. And for each mine, uh, we identified uh, several, uh, uh, several infrastructure features that could be emitters. So the most likely and the most prominent emitter for any coal mine is actually the exhaust fan. So here at the bottom part of this image, you can see the number 77 fan. So that's the exhaust fan that's uh, exhausting the ventilation air that they're using to ventilate the mine. So potential secondary sources of methane could also include the belt portal. So in other words, that's the area where the belts are actually coming out from underground with the coal and then bringing that to the surface and then transferring that then to a pile of coal where that's then uh, offloaded onto trucks or, or trains or whatever for transport uh, uh, to coal fire generation plants. So we did this for each of the 22 mines. We identified these various features and provided the lat long data, uh, not only for our own use, but also for, for the aircraft surveys. So what I'd like to do here is just kind of spend a couple of minutes uh, looking at this graphic to kind of give us uh, a groundwork for understanding the measurements uh, from the aircraft perspective as we go forward. So in general, uh, incoming solar radi radiation from the sun uh, comes to us in the form of uh, UV and visible light, right? So it's an incoming solar radiation and that uh, impacts the ground which then re-emits the radiation out to space, uh, largely in the infrared spectrum. So this is ongoing process. And then in the atmosphere, uh, we have greenhouse gases that include CO2, water vapor, methane, and then uh, uh, actually a, a, a host of other, uh, let's see what happened here, I lost my screen. You still with me there? So we have a, a, a collection of other greenhouse gases that absorb this outgoing infrared radiation and then re-emit some of that infrared radiation back to the surface. And that is the so-called so greenhouse gas effect. And it, it turns out that methane uh, is uh, absorbed uh, in the infrared, radi absorbs infrared radiation in the 1600 to 1700 uh, nanometer spectrum, a uh, part of the part of the infrared spectrum, and uh, this is basically the short wave infrared uh, uh, part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So we can use that relationship, then uh, exploit that relationship to understand uh, basically how much methane or other greenhouse gas there is in the atmosphere, and again that amount of absorbance is proportional to the concentration of the gas in the atmosphere, okay? So 
the way aircraft or satellite measurements are done uh, is that uh, over a certain column height, uh, so they have an on, we'll see this in the next slide, they have a spectrometer on board uh, and they can then measure the amount of infrared radiation that makes it into that spectrometer. And of course, as the amount of methane or some other greenhouse gas increases, uh, the amount of infrared radiation that's received in the spectrometer is reduced because it's been absorbed. And uh, with calibration, we can then uh, make uh, uh, a measurement then on the amount of that particular gas. And it turns out that these gases have unique wavelengths at which they absorb. And so that allows us then to isolate it's like the, the absorption wavelength for methane versus CO2, say versus water vapor, okay? So you, you can kind of do this for kind of a global atmospheric average uh, because methane is well mixed over a relatively short time span. Um, but then what happens then is through anthrop Progenic activities that background um, uh, that background concentration of methane or some other greenhouse gas, say CO two, then gets perturbed by the introduction from anthropogen anthropogenic sources. So I kind of show this graphically at the lower right. You know, we can imagine this might be a, a, a stack, say from a coal fired plant or it could be a ventilation fan that's emitting, we'll say for our purposes, methane. That methane then in the lower atmosphere uh, is aloft and gets dispersed by the wind. And then if you have an aircraft that flies over that source, uh, basically um, the anthropogenic source has increased the concentration of methane. And so the amount of absorption that, uh, that occurs in that column of air that's being observed by the aircraft uh, is increased. And that then shows up in the spectrum uh, spectrometer measurement in the aircraft. So uh, it turns out that for our purposes, uh, this column height of air uh, is about 3,000 meters uh, from the spectrometer uh, uh, to the ground. So this is uh, actually looking in the uh, fuselage of the uh, GHG SAT uh, aircraft. So a little background. So when we started this project, um, the idea was uh, that we would actually maybe try to use satellite uh, uh, data to, to look at methane emissions. And the same principles that I just described with the aircraft apply in the case of the satellite, except that the satellite, uh, I think, is uh, at, at 300 kilometers above the Earth's surface, uh, so uh, considerably higher up. And uh, but as a result of that greater altitude, uh, it does not have the detection threshold nor the spatial resolution that you might get in an aircraft. And it actually costs quite a bit more, not surprisingly. So when we uh, sat down with um, uh, this company, GHGSAT, which is a Canadian company to discuss our strategies, they suggested an aircraft. So a little bit of background on GHGSAT, uh, and I can ask, I can answer any additional questions people might have later. So GHGSAT is a Canadian company. Uh, they um, launched their first methane detecting satellite probably about five or six years ago called IRIS. Okay, so they were early players in the game. And um, so they're, they're basically a for-profit company. And what they do is they contract with private entities, uh, in our case, basically a university and state agency, uh, they contract with them to fly uh, methane measurement campaigns. And, um, and uh, what they do in these kind of cases, you basically are paying, of course, uh, they provide you some kind of uh, estimate on the cost to fly a certain number of uh, what they call assets. And then you develop a measurement campaign with them. And um, so, as I said, in our case, we opted because of the, the, the better res spatial resolution and higher detection thresholds, we opted to do an aircraft survey. They based this particular aircraft, which is a Piper Navajo out of Bowling Green. So that allowed them to access the mines in Eastern Kentucky. 
and then also mines in Western Kentucky from one central location. So the, 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 the aircraft is basically uh, two people in the aircraft during, during a campaign. Uh, there's the spectrometer operator and then the pilot, okay? And so this, there's a, a, a portal in the belly of the aircraft. Um, there is a camera, uh, this so-called uh, Fabi Perot uh, wide angle fixed cavity uh, camera and spectrometer that's focused downward that then measures the amount of infrared radiation that comes back in toward the belly of the plane. <clears throat> this, uh, the, the remarkable thing about all this is this is on a, um, a gimbal assembly so that that camera stays pretty level even during conditions that may be pretty choppy in terms of, uh, of flying the aircraft. The aircraft flies at about, uh, as I said, about 3000 meter altitude uh, and at about 120 knots. Under those conditions, the investiga investigation swath on the ground is about 750 meters. Uh, there's a remarkable spatial resolution of about 0.75 uh, meters squared. And the detection the threshold is also pretty remarkable at about 100 parts per billion uh, fresh uh, uh, methane. <clears throat> so this map comes from a report supplied to us from GHC SAP. And uh, as I said, we we provided them with 22 underground mines. Uh, at the end of the day, they end up surveying 21 mines over the time period. Uh, actually, that that's wrong. That's a that's September. I'm sorry, November 12th uh, through November 19th, 2021. So a little over a one week period. Uh, they flew each of these 21 mines at least twice and on separate days. And then actually some mines were sur surveyed uh, three or four times depending on the flight paths. So the, this is a map, I appreciate that this is hard to see and I apologize. Um, yeah, uh, this is a Google Earth map that was provided to us by GHCSAP. But the, the take home point here is that these really, uh, the, the red linear tracks represent the flight path that GHCSAP took between our mine assets when the spectrometer was running. So basically they're trying to maximize and be most efficient in their flight times uh, when they fly these paths. So uh, what I'm gonna do here in the next few slides is just show you a couple examples of, um, of uh, uh, some responses that GHG sat picked up um, uh, as they flew these. So what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna try to do this without, uh, I'm gonna I'll just show you real quick here. Um, see if I can. Uh, I'm gonna pull you into a Google Earth image uh, that allows us to see some of the attributes a little bit quicker. So this, uh, is the Pride Mine. Uh, this is a Google Earth image, the Pride Mine in Buhlenberg County. So I'm going to pull out here. And so what you can see here, uh, just to orient you, for those of you who are familiar, there's the Western Kentucky Parkway. And then here's the mine road coming in. And so you can see the targets that we provided to GHC SAT to cover on this, right? So they basically their path, flight path, took them across these four particular infrastructure targets. And the reason actually for pulling this in is I wanna show you how accurately we can identify the infrastructure. And so that's actually the ventilation fan for the Pride Mine. Um, and uh, I'll circle back to that. Uh, so I would just say, you know, keep that mental image uh, in your eye uh, as we go forward. Uh, sorry, I ended up back at my beginning. Uh, find my cursor here.
Okay, sorry about that. So, so there's that, uh, here's that fan, that ventilation fan we were just looking at. And uh, so here's a, uh, an image that's uh, higher up, okay? And the square that's on the right side uh, is this area that's enlarged here. So on the right-hand side, uh, that's the fan that I pointed out uh, previously, okay? And what you see here is this colored plume uh, going off uh, to the upper right. And what that plume shows is actually methane concentrations that are above background uh, at hundreds of PPB. So the, the scale bar here in the center represents, you know, going from the bottom 150 up to 500 PPB above background. So uh, hotter colors represent methane concentrations that uh, are higher concentrations of methane above background. And then cooler colors, of course, are lower concentrations above background. So what we can see here is that we see this plume trailing off to the, to the upper right or to the northeast. And that jibes on that particular day, this was done on November 16th, that jibes with a predominantly southwest wind on that day. So the one thing that uh, GHG set does is that given this plume distribution and the concentrations that are observed within it, um, they are able then to use that in local uh, atmospheric conditions, wind speed and direction to use an inverse model to estimate the emission rate of methane coming off of that fan. And in this particular example, it's 132 kilograms per hour, but the error associated with that is pretty significant at 78 kilograms per hour. And I can talk to folks more about this later, about this inverse modeling, um, uh, if they're interested. But as you can see, it's subject to a lot of error. So here's the mine, the same mine three days later. And I show you this because you can see uh, on the time scale of days, uh, there can be quite a bit of variation in what that plume looks like. So again, it's the same set of images we saw in the previous slide. Uh, scale bar is the same with the uh, concentrations of methane above background. And again, now instead we see a very small plume trailing off more to the west-northwest, which jibes with kind of a predominant southeast wind on that day. So uh, I'll circle back and make some comments about the aircraft campaign here uh, as we get uh, toward the end, end of my presentation. So what I'd like to do next is actually talk, spend this and the next few slides talking about the aircraft, uh, I'm sorry, the vehicle-based measurements. So uh, what I did was I took a KGS vehicle. So this is actually, I guess, our forerunner. Um, and I have, uh, uh, we have a spectrometer at KGS, a LICOR spectrometer, and then uh, Marcelo Guzman supplied a second spectrometer uh, that, like the, uh, like the aircraft spectrometer, measured the amount of methane that's being absorbed in the infrared spectrum. Now, unlike the aircraft, the spectrometers that I have on the KGS vehicles actually have pumps on them that actually actively pull air into an optical cavity where the methane's measured. So these PTFE tubes that you see running out the side window um, are connected to a roof, to the roof rack. And so those are basically intakes uh, where methane is brought into the infrared spectrometers, okay? So this is all powered with a deep cell marine battery, uh, uh, powers the spectrometers. Uh, in addition to uh, spectrometers, I, uh, have, I always brought along a uh, Kestrel weather station so I could see what was going on with wind speed and direction and atmospheric pressure. And then there was a, a Bueller GPS pod that was mounted on the window here uh, so that I was tracking uh, lat longs as the vehicle was doing surveys, uh, looking at, uh, at methane emissions. Um, so a couple important points is that uh, one of the like uh, one of the spectrometers measured methane, ethane, and water vapor, whereas another one measured methane, CO2, and water vapor. So we got uh, a nice coverage of different uh, uh, greenhouse gases uh, using the two spectrometers. 
So one of the things that I want to emphasize here um, is when we started this program, and this is a big deal, uh, we contacted, I think, almost all the mining companies to get permission to come onto property to do measurements closer to the ventilation fans. And uh, without exception, uh, we were either ignored or were told uh, thanks, but no thanks, okay? So the result of that, uh, uh, the result of that is that at least in the case of the vehicle surveys, we were largely relegated to doing what I call, or what I call fence line surveys. So basically we're on the outside looking in and so in order to look at methane emissions off of these different infrastructure elements of the mines, we basically had to find mines in which the roads were uh, in somewhat close proximity uh, to those uh, uh, mine infrastructure elements. And you'll see that uh, strategy here in the next slide. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, this, is an example of the Cardinal Mine in Hopkins County, okay? And so uh, there's a lot of interesting things going on here and I'll step you through it as we unpack it, okay? So this is Highway 41, uh, which runs along the south side of the Cardinal Mine. And it turns out that adjacent to the mine, there's actually a TC Energy Gas Compression Station, uh, which adds a further wrinkle on our effort to look at methane emissions, okay? So um, what I did when I collected the spectrometer data and the methane data, I basically tied that distribution of that data to the GPS lat long data using the time, the similar timestamps. So that allowed me then to plot methane concentrations in space uh, in Google Earth, okay? So what we're looking at here is a driving survey that I did uh, uh, along Withers Road, uh, then heading east along Highway Alternate 41 and then back up James Ellis Road. And the red pins represent methane concentrations that were recorded by the vehicle as it made this fence line survey around the Cardinal Mine and then also this TC gas compression station. So basically these are methane concentrations above background uh, since uh, GHG sat recorded values on uh, what we call a delta basis. Uh, these values represent delta values. So pretty, uh, so the stuff here with the lower uh, amplitude pins are pretty much background values. But then what happens is you see the pins really go off scale here. So we're getting to values, sorry, we're getting to values that are basically uh, it goes, uh, you can't see it right here, but they're 10 to 15 times above background. So basically values like 30 parts per million methane. So that's where these pins appear to be floating up in the air because the concentrations are so high. So as I continue around the traverse and then head north of James Ellis Road, uh, we'll see it better in the next slide. We get another anomaly. So we actually end up with two methane anomalies uh, in this area. So there's a second parameter that's plotted here, and that's actually shown with the blue pins. And I think I'll try to illustrate that more in the next slide. Now, so here's an enlargement of that previous slide. So we, we, just, we discussed, you know, the red pins represent the magnitude of methane emissions of a background. The blue pins actually represent the ratio of methane to ethane, okay? So remember, we were recording ethane uh, concentrations at the same time. And uh, going back to that previous slide, we can see that values here, this methane ratio stays fairly constant. And then when we get into this area where we get the really high methane concentrations, look what happens to the methane-ethane ratio. It drops off. And then as we come out of the anomaly, it comes back to background. And then we come north on James Ellis Road. And notice here that even though we have a methane anomaly, there's no change in the methane-ethane ratio. So what's going on here is we have methane that's being generated, and anthropogenic methane is being generated, but it's really coming from two sources. And those two sources really have uh, geochemically distinct fingerprints. The methane that's coming off of leakage off this TC energy station is naturally, it's related to natural gas, okay? And natural gas, T2 
tends to have higher molecular weight hydrocarbons associated with it, including ethane, propane, and so forth. As a result of that, the methane ethane ratio drops. Whereas uh, in contrast, the methane anomaly that's coming off the cardinal fan mine, which is right here, there's no change in the methane ethane ratio. So we can see that it is geochemically distinct from, uh, from, the, from, the, from the methane that's being uh, generated from the natural gas infrastructure. So this is a really interesting and cool discovery that uh, uh, even in areas where you have active mining, there's potentially so other sources of methane and you have to be careful not to go to a default mode of attributing the methane sources uh, to, to the coal mines. So in addition to active mines, uh, I looked at some of the inactive mines uh, in the state. And um, so here's an example of the Dotiki mine, which is now abandoned uh, over in Webster County. At one point, it was one of the largest mines in the state. The fan was located over on the, uh, kind of on this right side or the east side of the map. Again, driving survey, as I previously described, with the red pins representing methane concentrations above background. And we can see this nice little anomaly that occurs right here. Um, at the time, I attributed that anomaly to methane uh, that was still coming off the belt portal. Uh, so basically kind of a latent methane that's being generated. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, 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 I later just, came across new information uh, that suggested that maybe, maybe that is not the source of the, source of the methane, but maybe it's actually coming from some other, some other part of the coal mine. And I'm happy to talk to folks about that later uh, if need be. So I'm gonna kind of uh, violate one of the central tenets of giving a presentation by throwing a real ugly table up here, uh, but I think it really does an effective job of kind of showing how well the airplane and, and the vehicle uh, campaigns uh, perform in terms of detecting anomalous methane uh, with the various mines. So just in summary, uh, without really kind of getting into the weeds on the table, so this upper group of mines are active mines. Uh, this middle group of mines are these so-called non-productive active mines. And then finally, this lower set of four mines are the abandoned mines. Mm -hmm. And they're generally arranged uh, from increasing coal production at the top uh, to uh, less coal production here at the bottom, and of course, zero coal production for the non-productive active and abandoned mines. On the, on the left column where you see the red and green, okay, this basically shows where uh, yes, I got a detect, so that's shown with green, or no, I did not get a detect shown with red. So this first column are the airplane anomalies, okay? Uh, so you can see by, by and large, the airplane, um, uh, the airplane base survey was only effective at resolving anomalies at three of the 21 mines uh, they, they flew. By contrast, uh, where I was able to get close to some of the um, uh, underground mines with the vehicle, we were able to resolve anomalies at seven out of 10 uh, active mines and then two out of five inactive mines. So um, I have to tell you that these results are actually reversed of what I would have anticipated at the beginning of the project. And the reason for that is that given the really high detection thresholds that are being reported by GHGSAT, and the fact that they're flying directly over the top of these sources, I would have expected them to be in a much better position uh, to resolve these anomalies as opposed to being in a vehicle where you may not get close enough to resolve anomaly, and then you're also subject more to the whims of local topography and then also the uh, wind direction and speed. So this came as a, a bit of a surprise. And um, I will tell you, um, I, I, I'm attempting to write this up for publication, uh, it's, but it is always a more interesting challenge to write up a journal publication in which you're reporting by and large negative results 
and trying to speculate on why those results are negative as opposed to positive results. But I think it's important that we get that out there because I do think it's important for the scientific community, given all the press and notoriety that aircraft and satellite measurements are getting, are getting that they understand there are some potential limitations. So this is just kind of restating some of the things that I've already discussed. So I don't really want to get, uh, don't really need to bury into these at all. So you can kind of see this for yourself. So I guess what I'd like to do here, let's see, uh, how am I doing here? So 45 minutes. So last five minutes, uh, let's talk about drones, okay? So at the end, the end of the day, uh, drones, uh, you know, they were going to be really kind of a, an important component of this project. But when we were denied access to the mine sites, uh, the ability to actually deploy a drone become became much more challenged because the bottom line is, is that roads that are close to mines often have a lot of power lines. Uh, there's a lot of tree growth and so on and so forth. And so deploying the drones in a manner that's safe, legal, and close enough to the mine infrastructure to actually resolve something can be quite a challenge. So at the end of the day, we actually only had two mines that met kind of the criteria for safety and then also for our uh, analytical purposes and, and feeling like we had a chance to actually resolve any anomalies. So I worked with the mining, uh, the mechanical engineering group, Sean Bailey's group, they have a UAV laboratory. And for our purposes, uh, uh, we used, uh, uh, and for you guys that are uh, gals that are uh, drone weenies, uh, there's information there for you to, uh, to, to mull over. So a DGI S1000 octocopter, uh, it's equipped with sensors for pressure, temperature, relative humidity, and wind speed direction. And then out on the arms of the octocopter are four anemometers that record wind speed and direction. That data is then backed out uh, to track uh, basically the direction and uh, uh, of the drone once it's aloft. So what I'd like to do here is show you a couple of videos from the Straight Creek mine in Bell County. Um, and uh, then I'll show you kind of some of what those results look like. So uh, the first uh, video I'll play is a fan. The, the, this is the exhaust fan uh, at Straight Creek mine. And just to give you a sense. So this fan is oriented horizontally, okay? So this... So this road, and, and again, coming back to the road access, as you can see, it's really uh, in a nice position with respect to the fan to have a chance to look at more closely at emissions coming off the fan. And so the next video, so the, the, the engineering UAV van is parked right just before uh, the, this bridge, right? And uh, before this grove of trees, uh, they're parked here. And uh, we'll look at the drone as it's deployed uh, uh, for survey. Okay, so uh, as you can see, it would be basically used the clearing of the trees along the trace of the road to do a series of north-south traverses, uh, uh, looking at methane concentrations. Uh, oh, sorry. Let's go to the next one. Yeah, so here, so here's that road that we were looking at, looking to the north. Here's the fan uh, lo located here at the upper part of the diagram. And in this particular case, I plotted the methane concentrations above background that were observed by the drone as it's flying about 20 to 25 meters uh, above the ground surface. Okay, so we see two anomalies. 
coming off the fan here, right? And then this is finally what that looks like in profile. So uh, the black curve shows the altitude of the drone. This is one of the traverses we actually flew. I think we ended up with 10 traverses back and forth. So I'm just showing one of the traverses. So this is as it's, uh, you know, as it's ascending, comes to altitude, and then we then stabilized. Like I said, that's about 22 uh, meters above the ground surface. And then the blue curve actually shows then uh, uh, methane concentrations above background. So we can see that we get that peak that we saw in the previous image, you know, and then the second methane peak. So if we go back, yeah, we have this peak, the initial peak here, and then there's a second methane peak here, right here. So the interesting thing about this is like an interesting learning experience is that on subsequent trips, by the drone, basically along the same route, these peaks soon disappear. And it's not clear to me uh, the reason for that because the spectrometer uh, on the drone is deployed, uh, the tubes for the intakes are deployed actually above the level of the rotor wash. So we're trying to avoid having rotor wash impact our ability to do measurements. So yeah, it's not clear to me what's going on, um, but if indeed you know we lose that methane concentration pretty rapidly going up and it dissipates, that could suggest an impact the ability of something like an aircraft then to pick up methane anomalies. So uh, yeah, that's what I have to say for today. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that folks might have. And, and thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Are you with me, Liz? Good. Yeah, I'm here. OK. Thank you. That was great. So yeah, if anybody has any questions. Uh, Marty, yeah. Pete Edstein here. Uh, did you think about doing anything with a uh, uh, cavity ring down that's uh, tuned for methane? Uh, would there be any value in looking at uh, uh, isotopes uh, uh, within the methane that would be specific to different sources? Uh, yeah, I mean, that certainly, I, I took discrete samples, Pete, and sent them into a lab, but yeah, I mean, if you had a on a cavity ring down spectrometer with isotope capabilities on location, uh, yeah, I mean, that would be an important, um, uh, uh, important way to maybe look at some of the differences uh, in methane. The interesting thing is, is Pete, is that uh, actually, at the Straight Creek mine that I just showed you, uh, I was sufficiently confident that the methane there was coming from the coal mine that I did go ahead and collect samples actually on the same day that we flew the drone survey. And it turns out, isotopically and molecularly speaking, um, it looks like a, thermo, uh, a mature thermogenic uh, gas that's uh, derived from oil and gas with the primary exception being that it does not accompany by the higher molecular weight hydrocarbons. So it's a straight up methane with a del C13 value of about minus 46 per mil. Uh, yeah, about minus 42 per mil, I should say. And, uh, but it doesn't have, like I said, it's just pretty, it's a pretty dry gas. It's just straight up methane. Thanks, Pete. Any other questions for anybody? Okay. Well, thank you, Marty. Yeah. That was welcome. really great. That was really interesting. So I yeah, appreciate your time and your interest. Everybody have a good weekend. Yep. Go UK. <laughs> Yes, go UK. <laughs>